for the hardest hitting show in talk radio. The true progressive voice since 2012. This is South Pause. And welcome to Southpaws on the Pacifica Radio Network. We are the leaders of the revolution. I'm Darren Gibson, your host. We have to talk about probably the biggest news story this year, the cargo ship that ran into the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, Maryland. Six people dead, or presumed dead. Uh, they have not fo- recovered the bodies yet as of uh, the time that we're recording this show. So we will talk about that. We have a lot of Trump news to talk about, including his latest scheme to scam people out of their money. And we've got plenty of other topics to discuss today. Before we get into those, a couple of reminders. You can follow us on social media by going to facebook.com forward slash South Paws Radio Show. You can follow us on Twitter, or X, the former Twitter, at South Paws Radio. You can follow us on Tumblr at southpawsradioshow.tumblr.com. You can follow us on YouTube and Mastodon by doing a search for South Paws Radio. You can become a patron of the show by going to patreon.com forward slash South Paws Radio. You can listen to the show anytime at Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Podcast Addict, Podvine, and Pandora by doing a search for South Paws. Once you found our logo, you found us. We send links to our weekly episodes to our Facebook, X, YouTube, Mastodon, and Tumblr accounts. You can listen to us on Global Community Radio Channel 1 every Saturday night at 11 Eastern, and you can listen to us on great Pacifica stations, including KCEI in Taos, New Mexico, and KZGM in Kabul, Missouri. Be sure to listen to us on your local Pacifica affiliate. We are recording this show on Wednesday, March 27th, 2024. Let's get into our top story here. This is Leah Skeen writing for the Associated Press. This is dated March 26th out of Baltimore. A cargo ship lost power and rammed into a major bridge in Baltimore early Tuesday, destroying the span in a matter of seconds and plunging it into the river in a terrifying collapse that could disrupt a vital shipping port for months. Six people were missing and presumed dead, and the search for them was suspended until Wednesday morning, and they've continued the search. I don't believe they've found any of the bodies yet. The ship's crew issued a mayday call moments before the crash took down the Francis Scott Key Bridge, enabling authorities to limit vehicle traffic on the span, according to Maryland's governor. Yeah, and if it had been any other time in the day except 1.30 in the morning, this would have been an even worse disaster because the cops got the bridge shut down in about 40 seconds. It took them 40 seconds to shut down both sides of the bridge. And it was basically a span of four minutes between the mayday call and the ship hitting the bridge. As the vessel neared the bridge, puffs of black smoke could be seen as the lights flickered on and off. It struck one of the bridge's supports, causing the structure to collapse like a toy, and a section of the span came to rest on the bow. Maryland Governor Wes Moore said that with the ship barreling toward the bridge at, quote, a very, very rapid speed, end of quote, authorities had just enough time to stop cars from coming over the bridge. He added, quote, these people are heroes. They saved lives last night, end of quote. In the evening, Colonel Roland L. Butler, Jr., superintendent for Maryland State Police, announced that the search and rescue mission was transitioning to one of search and recovery. He also said the search was being put on pause and divers would return to the site at 6 a.m. Wednesday when challenging overnight conditions were expected to improve. No bodies have been recovered, according to Butler. And I, like I said, I don't think any have been recovered uh, since then. The crash happened in the middle of the night, long before the busy morning commute on the bridge that stretches 1.6 miles and was used by 12 million vehicles last year. The six missing people were part of a construction crew filling potholes on the bridge. That's according to Paul Weidefeld, the state's transportation secretary. Guatemala's consulate in Maryland said in a statement that two of the missings were citizens of the Central American nation. 
It did not provide their names, but said consular officials were in contact with authorities in assisting the families. Honduras's Deputy Foreign Affairs Minister Antonio Garcia told the Associated Press that a Honduran citizen uh, named Maynor Yasir Suazo Sandoval was missing. He said he had been in contact with Suazo's family. And the Washington Consulate of Mexico said via the social media platform X that citizens of that nation were also among the missing, but it did not say how many. A senior executive at the company that employed the workers also said in the afternoon that the workers were presumed dead given the water's depth and how much time had passed. Jeffrey Pritzker, executive vice president of Bronner Builders, said the crew was working in the middle of the bridge when it came down. Yeah, they were sealing potholes. Pritzker said, quote, this was so completely unforeseen we don't know what else to say. We take such great pride in safety, and we have cones and signs and lights and barriers and flaggers, end of quote. Jesus Campos, who has worked on the bridge for Browner Builders and those members of the crew, said he was told they were on a break and some were sitting in their trucks. Campos said, quote, I know that a month ago I was there, and I know what it feels like when the trailers pass. Imagine knowing that is falling. It is so hard, one would not know what to do, end of quote. Father Akko Walker, a Roman Catholic priest at Sacred Heart of Jesus, said he spent time with families of the missing workers as they awaited news of their loved ones. Walker said, quote, you can see the pain etched on their faces, end of quote. Rescuers pulled out two people from the water, one of whom was treated at a hospital and discharged hours later. Multiple vehicles also went into the river, although authorities did not believe anyone was inside. Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott called it an unthinkable tragedy and said, quote, it looked like something out of an action movie, end of quote. A police dispatcher put out a call just before the collapse saying a ship had lost its steering and asked officers to stop all traffic on the bridge. According to Maryland Transportation Authority, first responder radio traffic obtained by the Broadcastify.com archive. One officer who stopped traffic radioed that he was going to drive onto the bridge to alert the construction crew. But seconds later, a frantic officer said, quote, the whole bridge just fell down. Start, start whoever, everybody, the whole bridge just collapsed, end of quote. On a separate radio channel for maintenance and construction workers, someone said officers were stopping traffic because a ship had lost steering. There was no follow-up order to evacuate, and 30 seconds later, the bridge fell and the channel went silent. From 1960 to 2015, there were 35 major bridge collapses worldwide due to ship or barge collisions, according to the World Association for Waterborne Transport Infrastructure. Tuesday's collapse is sure to create a logistical nightmare along the East Coast for months, if not years, shutting down ship traffic at the Port of Baltimore, a major hub. The loss of the bridge will also snarl cargo and commuter traffic. State Senator Johnny Ray Soling said, quote, Losing this bridge will devastate the entire area as well as the entire East Coast, end of quote. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg said in a news conference that it was too soon to estimate how long it will take to clear the channel, which is about 50 feet deep. He said, quote, I do not know of a bridge that has been constructed to withstand a direct impact from a vessel of this size, end of quote. The Dali, which was headed from Baltimore to Colombo, Sri Lanka, and flying under a Singapore flag, is about 985 feet long and about 157 feet wide, according to data from marine traffic. Synergy Marine Group, which manages the ship, confirmed that it hit a pillar of the bridge at about 1.30 a.m. while in control of one or more pilots, who are local specialists who help guide vessels safely into and out of ports. The ship is owned by Grace Ocean Private Limited. Synergy said all crew members and the two pilots on board were accounted for, there were no reports of any injuries. The ship was moving at eight knots, roughly nine miles per hour, according to the governor. Inspectors found a problem with the Dolly's machinery in June, but a more recent examination did not identify any deficiencies, according to the shipping information system Equasis. Danish shipping agent Maersk said it had chartered the vessel. Jagged remnants of the bridge could be seen jutting up from the water in the aftermath of the collapse. The on-ramp ended abruptly where the span once began. Donald Heinbuck, a retired chief with Baltimore's fire department, said he was startled awake by a deep rumbling that shook his house for several seconds 
and felt like an earthquake. He drove to the river's edge and couldn't believe what he saw. He said, quote, the ship was there and the bridge was in the water like it was blown up, end of quote. The bridge spans the Patapsco River at the entrance to the busy harbor, which leads to the Chesapeake Bay and Atlantic Ocean. Opened in 1977, the bridge is named for the writer of the Star Spangled Banner. Weidfeld said all vessel traffic into and out of the port would be suspended until further notice, though the facility was still open to trucks. President Joe Biden said he planned to travel to Baltimore and intends for the federal government to pick up the entire cost of rebuilding, with Biden adding, quote, this is going to take some time, end of quote. Last year, the Port of Baltimore handled a record 52.3 million tons of foreign cargo worth $80 billion, according to the state. The head of a supply chain management company said Americans should expect shortages of goods from the collapse's effect on ocean container shipping and East Coast trucking. Ryan Peterson, CEO of Flexport, said, quote, it's not just the Port of Baltimore that's going to be impacted, end of quote. Yeah, because those ships are going to have to find other ports to unload their cargo, I guess. The collapse, though, is not likely to hurt worldwide trade because Baltimore is not a major port for container vessels. Its facilities are more important when it comes to goods such as farm equipment and autos. That is according to Judah Levine, head of research for global freight booking platform Freightos. So we'll be staying with that story for the long haul, and it's definitely going to take a long time for that bridge to be first removed from the water so that the shipping traffic can go in and out. And then the bridge has to be replaced, which is going to take several years. So uh, luckily there are two other bridges over that area, so traffic should be uh, minimally, I'm sure there'll be delays, but it not, not to any uh, very lengthy degree, I would think. Although 12 million cars a year is a lot. All right, let's get into some political news. We now have the latest scam that Donald Trump is involved in. This is Jill Colvin writing for the Associated Press. This is dated March 26th out of New York City. Donald Trump is now selling Bibles as he runs to return to the White House. <laughs> oh, my God. I bought a Bible from the devil. Bobby... Why did you do that? Donald Trump is the devil. Yes, mama. Yeah, mama. Mama, mama. <laughs> Bobby Boucher and Waterboy. Oh, my gosh. That's the first thing when I, when I saw that meme about buying a Bible from the devil. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> Trump, who became the presumptive Republican nominee earlier this month, released a video on his Truth Social platform on Tuesday urging his supporters to buy the God Bless the USA Bible, which is inspired by country singer Lee Greenwood's patriotic ballad. Oh, my God, Puke City. I hate that song. I loathe that song. I wish every copy of God Bless the USA would get rounded up and burned. Oh, I hate that song, and I hate Lee Greenwood for singing it. Trump takes the stage to the song at each of his rallies and has appeared with Greenwood at events. Yeah, because Lee Greenwood is nothing but a Republican piece of crap. Just like most of Nashville. Just going to say it. Most of your country stars are big Republicans. Well, with the exception of Taylor Swift. <laughs> Woohoo! I bet that just pisses off the conservatives, and I love it. Oh, my God. Here's what he wrote on Truth Social. Oh, my God. Quote, Happy Holy Week. Let's make America pray again. As we lead into Good Friday and Easter, I encourage you to get a copy of the God Bless the USA Bible. End of quote. Oh, my goodness. Unbelievable. Yep, cuckoo. Anybody that buys that is cuckoo. By the way, the price for this Bible, $59.99. Oh, my goodness. So just a penny short of 60 bucks. <laughs> 
The effort comes as Trump has faced a serious money crunch amid mounting legal bills while he fights four criminal indictments along with a series of civil charges. Trump was given a reprieve Monday when a New York appeals court agreed to hold off on collecting the more than $454 million he owes following a civil fraud judgment if he puts up $175 million within 10 days. We'll talk more about that a little bit later in the show. Trump has already posted a $92 million bond in connection with defamation cases brought by the writer E. Jean Carroll, who accused Trump of sexual assault. In the video posted on Truth Social, Trump said, quote, All Americans need a Bible in their home, and I have many. Oh, really? Oh, my God. He's, I got a ton of Bibles in my house. Yeah, just because you read a Bible doesn't make you a Christian. Doesn't make you religious whatsoever. Got news for you. It's my favorite book, he continues. <laughs> I'm proud to endorse and encourage you to get this Bible. We must make America pray again. End of quote. No, we need America to become an atheist nation. About time. We're on our way there. One quarter of this country doesn't believe. So there you go, folks. We're taking over. And the Christians hate it. Oh, they're scared to death about it. Oh, no, we can't let those bad atheists just do whatever they want to. That's just wrong. We feel offended. Yeah, I'd like to offend them. I'd like to offend them with my fist right upside their head. Billing itself as the only Bible endorsed by Donald Trump. <laughs> the New Ventures website calls it easy to read with large print and a slim design that invites you to explore God's word anywhere, anytime. End of quote. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Bible is just the latest commercial venture that Trump has pursued while campaigning. By the way, they repeatedly referred in this article to Trump as either president or former president. We don't do that on this show because he doesn't deserve it. He's a scumbag. Gah. He's a scab and a scumbag. So there you go, orange piece of crap. He is. Besides the King James Version translation, it includes copies of the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the Pledge of Allegiance, as well as a handwritten chorus of the famous Lee Greenwood song. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, one of these things is not like the other. Yeah, the last place that the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence belong is in a Bible. Sorry, this country was founded on the separation of church and state. Period. End of story. Ask Thomas Jefferson. Oh, my God. People are just out of their freaking minds. The Bible is just the latest commercial venture that Trump has pursued while campaigning. Last month, he debuted a new line of Trump-branded sneakers, including $399 gold Never Surrender High Tops at SneakerCon in Philadelphia. The venture behind the shoes, 45 Footwear, also sells other Trump-branded footwear, cologne, and perfume. Oh, my God. Trump has also dabbled in NFTs or non-fungible tokens. <laughs> NFT for me stands for not f***ing Trump <laughs> uh, Last year the NFT scam reported earning between $100,000 and a million dollars From a series of digital trading cards that portrayed him in cartoon like images Including as an astronaut, a cowboy, and a superhero Oh, Donald Trump is reliving his childhood. Yes, I am an astronaut. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a cowboy. I want to be a super. I can do all three at once with my orange skin and my fake hair. Oh, my God. Donald Trump is facing four criminal indictments in a civil lawsuit. He has also released books featuring photos of his time in office and letters written to him through the years. Oh, my God. I, I can't write a letter to him because I'd get called by the Secret Service. What did you put in this letter? 
<laughs> oh yeah hey it's not as bad as what other people have said that are within my circle of trust <laughs> Oh, goodness gracious. Uh, the website says, God bless USA Bible.com is not owned, managed, or controlled by Donald J. Trump, the Trump Organization, CIC Ventures, LLC, or any of their respective principals or affiliates. Instead, it says, God bless USA.com Bible uses Donald J. Trump's name, likeness, and image under paid license from CIC Ventures LLC, which license may be terminated or revoked according to its terms. CIC Ventures LLC, a company that Trump reported owning in his 2023 financial disclosure, has a similar agreement with 45 Footwear, which also says it uses Trump's name, likeness, and image under paid license from CIC Ventures LLC, etc., etc. A Trump spokesperson and God bless the USA Bible did not immediately respond to questions about how much Trump was paid for the licensing deal or stands to make from each book sale. I'm sure it's a lot. Oh my, who the hell would buy a Bible from that con man? Really? Well, P.T. Barnum did say there's a sucker born every minute and time keeps ticking. Oh my God. Uh, Trump remains deeply popular with white evangelical Christians who are among his most ardent supporters, even though the thrice-married former reality TV star has a long history of behavior that often seemed at odds with teachings espoused by Christ and the Gospels. Good on the Associated Press for calling it like it is. <laughs> When he was running in 2016, Trump raised eyebrows when he cited two Corinthians at Liberty University instead of the standard second Corinthians. Yeah, because Trump's never read the Bible a day in his whole goddamn life. If you think he has, you're being bamboozled. When asked to share his favorite Bible verse in an interview with Bloomberg Politics in 2015, he passed on it, saying, quote, I wouldn't want to get into it because to me, that's very personal. The Bible means a lot to me, but I don't want to get into specifics. End of quote. It's because he's never read the whole thing. If any, I don't think he's cracked it open once. As many times as he's cheated on his wives and has scammed people. Where's the say in the Bible, Donnie? To go ahead and not pay your contractors for work that they do for you. Where does it say to go ahead and impregnate your lover and then ditch your wife and marry her? Talking about Marla Maples. Come on, Donnie. I know that you know. I know that you know. (laughs) Uh, When he was in the White House, law enforcement officers aggressively removed racial justice protesters from a park near the White House, allowing Trump to walk nearby St. John's Church where he stood alone and raised a Bible. The scene was condemned at the time by the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington. Before he ran for office, Trump famously hawked everything from frozen steaks to vodka to a venture named Trump University, which was later sued for fraud. Yeah, because he is a fraud. He's unbelievable, folks. Unreal. So that's his latest new venture. Have fun with it if you buy one of his Bibles. You know what? I can get a good look at a T-bone by sticking my head up a bull's ass, but I'd rather take the butcher's word for it. Yeah, there you go. That's about how I feel with the whole Donald Trump selling Bibles thing. Donald Trump selling Bibles. (laughs) All right, let's get into our next story. This is Michael R. Sizak, Jake Offenhartz, and Eric Tucker writing for the Associated Press dated March 25th out of New York City. The first of Donald Trump's four criminal trials will begin April 15th that, that was the ruling from a Manhattan judge on Monday after tearing into Trump's lawyers for what he said were unfounded claims that the hush money case had been tainted by prosecutorial misconduct. Judge Juan M. Merchant scoffed at the defense's calls to delay the case longer or throw it out entirely because of a last-minute document dump that had bumped the first-ever trial of a former president from its scheduled Monday start. Trump vowed to appeal the ruling. Oh, f*** you. 
Barring another delay, the presumptive Republican nominee will be on trial as a criminal defendant in just three weeks. An inauspicious homecoming in the city where he grew up, built a real estate empire, yeah, and gained wealth and celebrity that propelled him to the White House. Yeah, he gained wealth the way other rich people gain wealth. He scammed people and took advantage. Took advantage of labor, took advantage of his contractors. You, it's all in the, it's all out there for you. You just got to read it. The trial involving allegations related to hush money paid during Trump's 2016 campaign to cover up marital infidelity claims had been in limbo after his lawyers complained about a recent deluge of nearly 200,000 pages of evidence from a previous federal investigation into the matter. Trump's lawyers accused Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg's office of intentionally failing to pursue evidence from the 2018 federal investigation, which sent Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, to prison. They contended prosecutors working under Bragg, a Democrat, did so to gain an unfair advantage in the case and harm Trump's election chances. Oh, really? <laughs> Bullsh**. Cohen, now a vocal Trump critic, is poised to be a key prosecution witness against his boss, and I'm going to enjoy it. <laughs> oh, this is going to be great when this trial starts. I, ho I hope it gets coverage every single day. I wish there were cameras allowed in the court. It'd be great watching Donald Trump sit there with a big pout on his orange face. Oh, jeez. Merchant bristled at the defense's claims at a hearing Monday saying the DA's office had no duty to collect evidence from the federal investigation, nor was the U.S. Attorney's Office required to volunteer the documents. What transpired was a fire cry from Manhattan prosecutors, quote, injecting themselves in the process and vehemently and aggressively trying to obstruct your ability to get documentation, end of quote. That's the judge saying this. Merchant added, quote, it's just not what happened, end of quote. Merchant grew impatient, pressing Trump lawyer Todd Blanche to cite even a single legal precedent for his argument. When the lawyer couldn't, the judge laid into him, saying, quote, You're literally accusing the Manhattan DA's office and the people assigned to this case of engaging in prosecutorial misconduct and of trying to make me complicit in it, and you don't have a single cite to support that position. End of quote. Assistant District Attorney Matthew Colangelo said the number of relevant, usable new documents in the recently provided evidence is quite small, around 300 records or fewer. Trump's lawyers contend thousands of pages are potentially important and require painstaking review. They argued the delayed disclosures warranted dismissing the case or at least pushing it off three months. Blanche told the judge, quote, we are not doing our jobs if we don't independently look at the new material. Every document is important, end of quote. And it really. Here's the funny part about it. The judge went through the documents. The judge went through all 200,000 pages. Sorry. If he can do it, the defense attorney can do it too, along with their team. Sorry, that's the way it is. The DA's office denied wrongdoing and blamed Trump's lawyers for bringing the time crunch upon themselves by waiting until January 18th to subpoena the records from the U.S. Attorney's Office, a mere nine weeks before the trial was originally supposed to start. Merchant, who earlier this month postponed the trial until at least mid-April to deal with the evidence issue, told defense lawyers that they should have acted sooner if they believed they didn't have all the records they wanted. Trump complained about the ruling outside court, renewing his complaint that the case is election interference. Trump said, quote, this is a case that could have been brought three and a half years ago, and now they're fighting over days because they want to try and do it during the election. This is election interference. That's all it is. Election interference, and this is a disgrace. End of quote. No, it's called justice, you orange piece of shit. The hearing took place the same day a New York appeals court granted Trump a dose of good news by agreeing to hold off collection of his $454 million civil fraud judgment if he puts up $175 million within 10 days. The dueling developments underscored New York's place as an epicenter of Trump's legal peril. Though the hush money case is seen as less consequential than his other prosecutions, 
was charged him with conspiring to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election and illegally retaining classified documents. It has taken on added importance given that it's the only one that appears likely for trial in the coming months. The trial will begin with jury selection, a potentially arduous task given the publicity surrounding the case and Trump's wild unpopularity in heavily Democratic Manhattan. Trump has pleaded not guilty to charges that he falsified business records, a felony punishable by up to four years in prison, though there is no guarantee a conviction would result in jail time. Manhattan prosecutors say Trump did it as part of an effort to protect his 2016 campaign by burying what he says were false stories of extramarital sex. Trump on Monday repeated to reporters his claims that the case is a witch hunt and a hoax. So, yeah. That's not what Stormy Daniels said, and she's got the proof, buddy. Cash checks. Cash checks leave a trail. Sorry. Prosecutors allege that Trump falsely logged payments to Cohen, then his personal lawyer, as fees in his company books when they were for his work covering up stories that might embarrass Trump. That included $130,000 that he paid porn actress Stormy Daniels on Trump's behalf so she wouldn't publicize her claim of a sexual encounter with him years earlier. By the way, while Melania was pregnant. Trump's lawyers say the payments to Cohen were legitimate legal expenses, not cover-up checks. Really? Cohen pleaded guilty in 2018 to federal campaign finance violations related to the Daniels payoff. He said Trump directed him to arrange it and federal prosecutors indicated they believed him, but Trump was never charged. Trump's lawyers said Bragg's office turned over just a fraction of materials from that investigation last June. The material hasn't been made public, but Trump's lawyer said in a court filing that some of it is, quote, exculpatory and favorable to the defense, end of quote. The sharing of evidence called discovery is routine in criminal cases and is intended to help ensure a fair trial. Bragg's deputies have insisted they, quote, engaged in good faith and diligent efforts to obtain relevant information, end of quote, from the federal probe. They argued in court filings that Trump's lawyers should have spoken up earlier if they believed those efforts were lacking. Prosecutors maintain that in any event, the vast majority of what ultimately came as irrelevant, duplicative, or backups existing evidence about Cohen's well-known federal conviction. So let's get on to the appeal, the uh, bond, the dropping of $454 million down to 175 million, which I think is absolute crap. This is Jennifer Peltz writing for the Associated Press. This is dated March 26th out of New York. Donald Trump got a break this week when an appeals court cut down the amount of money he needs to put up to pause collection while he appeals a $454 million-plus judgment in his New York civil fraud case. By the way, once again, they refer to Trump as former president. We don't do that on this show, and we encourage you not to do it either. So here's a look at what happened and what could happen next. The judgment reflects the $355 million plus interest and growing daily that state judge Arthur Engeron ordered Trump to pay after a months-long trial. The trial stemmed from a lawsuit brought by State Attorney General Letitia James. She claimed that Trump, his company, and key executives engaged in fraud by pumping up the tycoon-turned-politician's fortune on financial statements that helped secure loans and insurance. Trump, now once again the presumptive Republican presidential nominee, denied the allegations as did his co-defendants. The defense said bankers and insurers used the unaudited statements only to inform their own assessments of Trump's finances rather than basing business decisions on them. He says the documents understated his wealth anyway. Ingeron ruled last month for the attorney general. Trump has appealed. So here's what the appeals court did. A five-judge panel of appeal judges agreed Monday to put the collection on hold if Trump puts up $175 million within 10 days. It was a considerable reprieve, especially given that one of the judges had turned down Trump's earlier offer of a $100 million bond. Under New York law, someone can hold off enforcement of a judgment during an appeal by posting a bond, essentially a guarantee that the money will be paid if the appeal fails or otherwise covering the amount owed. The idea is to ensure that people who have won judgments will be able to collect if they're upheld. 
Usually that means the whole amount, but appeals courts can consider whether debtors would suffer an irreparable loss if they covered the judgment but later won their appeals. That's according to Jay Oslander, a New York lawyer who specializes in collecting big judgments. Trump, for example, suggested on social media last week that he'd have to sell or mortgage properties, perhaps at fire sale prices, quote, and if and when I win the appeal, they would be gone. Does that make sense? End of quote. Makes sense to me. That's called justice, buddy. His lawyer said that he was unable to arrange a bond for the full $454 million plus. They said potential underwriters were requiring 120% of the judgment or over $557 million in collateral and would take only cash or other liquid assets, not real estate. The Trump Organization's top lawyer, Alan Garten, said in a sworn statement that posting the full amount could affect the company's ability to retain employees, meet obligations, and otherwise sustain its business. Meanwhile, Trump said on his Truth Social platform that he has almost $500 million in cash but wants the option of spending some on his campaign, which we'll get to that quote in just a little bit. James's office, meanwhile, has filed notice of the judgment, a technical step toward potentially moving the collect. So what does Trump plan to do now? Shortly after learning of the appeals court decision, Trump said he would swiftly come up with a bond, equivalent securities, or cash. Various companies offer appeal bonds for a fee. They typically also require collateral. Gregory Germain, a Syracuse University College of Law professor who focuses includes commercial law and bankruptcy, said, quote, the bonding company is not going to put up a bond unless they're assured that they're going to get paid back if they have to pay, end of quote. Collateral can come in various forms, such as providing cash or pledging an investment account, or at least in theory, real estate. Before Monday's ruling, Trump insurance broker and friend Gary Giulietti told the appeals court in a sworn statement that major underwriters generally won't issue a single bond for over $100 million. State lawyers have suggested Trump could get bonds from multiple sources. That has happened in other cases. As for Trump's coffers, he could reap a windfall from his stock in his social media company. Share prices shot up Tuesday during Trump Media and Technology Group Corp's first day of trading on the NASDAQ exchange. Trump holds a nearly 60% stake in the company, which could be worth billions of dollars if gains hold. For now, though, the company's lockup provision prevents insiders from selling their newly issued shares for six months. What has Trump done in other cases? Earlier this month, Trump obtained a $91.6 million appeals bond to cover money that a federal civil court jury awarded to writer E. Jean Carroll. She alleges that Trump sexually assaulted her in the 1990s and then defamed her when she publicly accused him in 2019. He denies all of Carroll's claims and is appealing. Federal Insurance Company, a unit of the insurance giant Chubb, underwrote that bond. It covers 110% of the $83.3 million owed. After an earlier but related federal civil trial involving Carol, Trump put more than $5.5 million in cash in a court escrow account while appealing the jury verdict in that trial. If the verdict is upheld on appeal, that money will cover the judgment. Anything left over would go back to Trump. If the verdict is ultimately overturned, he'll get the full amount back. So there's that's how bonds work at least in New York State. So that that's a very good explanation of what's going on there. Uh, let's go ahead to our next story. This is Mike Schneider writing for the Associated Press. This is dated March 27th. Out of Orlando, Florida. We haven't talked about this in a while. The feud between Walt Disney Company and Florida Governor Ron Death Sentence. So here's the latest update on that. Allies of Governor Ron Death Sentence and Disney reached a settlement agreement Wednesday in a state court fight over how Walt Disney World is developed in the future following the takeover of the theme parks, resorts, government by the Florida governor. In a meeting, the members of the board of the Central Florida Tourism Oversight District approved the settlement agreement, ending almost two years of litigation that was sparked by DeSantis' takeover of the district from Disney supporters following the company's opposition to Florida's so-called Don't Say Gay law. The 2022 law bans classroom lessons on sexual orientation and gender identity in early grades and was championed by Death Sentence, who used Disney as a punching bag in speeches until he suspended his presidential campaign this year. 
The district provides municipal services such as firefighting, planning, and mosquito control, among other things, and was controlled by Disney supporters for most of its five decades. Jeff Vale, president of Walt Disney World Resort, said in a statement Wednesday that the company was pleased that a settlement had been reached. Vale said, quote, This agreement opens a new chapter of constructive engagement with the new leadership of the district and serves the interests of all parties by enabling significant continued investment and the creation of thousands of direct and indirect jobs and economic opportunity in the state. End of quote. As punishment for Disney's opposition to the law, a death sentence took over the, fl- the governing district through legislation passed by the Republican-controlled Florida legislature and appointed a new board of supervisors. Disney sued death sentence and his appointees, claiming the company's free speech rights were violated for speaking out against the legislation. A federal judge dismissed that lawsuit in January. Well, I don't know why. It is clear cut. Hey, if corporations are people then they also have the right to free speech. Sorry, that's the way it is. The Supreme Court ruled the companies are people, so there you go. Before control of the district changed hands from Disney allies to death sentence appointees early last year, the Disney supporters on its board signed agreements with Disney, shifting control over design and construction at Disney World to the company. The new death sentence appointees claimed the 11th hour deals neutered their powers and the district sued the company in state court in Orlando to have the contracts voided. Disney filed counterclaims that include asking the state court to declare the agreements valid and enforceable. Under the terms of Wednesday's settlement agreement, Disney let stand a determination by the board of death sentences appointees that the comprehensive plan approved by the Disney supporters before the takeover are null and void. Disney also agrees that a development agreement and restrictive covenants passed before the takeover are also not valid, according to the settlement terms. Instead, a comprehensive plan from 2020 will be used with the new board able to make changes to it, and the agreement suggests Disney and the new board will negotiate a new development agreement in the near future. Yeah, they should not have settled. They should have fought it all the way to the end, because Disney's got more money than Death Sentence ever will. Sorry, they do. By the way, there is a possibility that the death sentence could be Trump's running mate, which God help us all if that happens. All right, let's get to some good news for a change. This is Kim Chandler writing for the Associated Press. This is dated March 27th out of Alabama. Marilyn Lands, a Democrat who made reproductive rights the centerpiece of her campaign in deeply conservative Alabama, has won a special election to the Alabama State Legislature. Lanz's victory in the suburban district in the Deeth South State was celebrated by Democrats who have attempted to portray the state GOP as too extreme on abortion and reproductive rights. Alabama has a near total ban on abortion and in vitro fertilization services were paused last month because of a court ruling equating frozen embryos to children. That's like me going to get an egg out of the fridge and saying I'm having chicken dinner tonight. Same thing. Same exact thing. Lands defeated Republican Teddy Powell to win the open legislative seat according to the unofficial returns Tuesday. Powell, a member of the Madison City Council, issued a statement conceding the race and congratulating Lands on her victory. Lands said, quote, Today, Alabama women and families send a clear message that will be heard in Montgomery and across the nation. Our legislature must repeal Alabama's no-exceptions abortion ban, fully restore access to IVF, and protect the right to contraception. End of quote. The district represents parts of the cities of Madison and Huntsville, which is home to the Army's Redstone Arsenal and NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. The win was a rare victory for Democrats in the Deep South State where Republicans hold all statewide offices and a lopsided majority in the Alabama legislature. Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee President Heather Williams called the victory, quote, a political earthquake in Alabama. She continued, quote, this special election is a harbinger of things to come. Republicans across the country have been put on notice that there are consequences to attacks on IVF from the bluest blue state to the reddest red. Voters are choosing to fight for their fundamental freedoms by electing Democrats across the country. End of quote. Yeah, you got that right. Yep.
Lands, a licensed counselor, unsuccessfully ran for the seat in 2022, but lost by seven points to Republican David Cole. The legislative seat became open again after Cole stepped down and pleaded guilty to a charge that he rented a closet-sized space to fraudulently run for office in a district where he did not live. Lands will finish the term and will be up for election in 2026 when the governor's office and other races will be on the ballot. So there you go, folks, some good news for once. And speaking of people carpetbagging into other districts, let's get to our next story. Back to Ottawa County. This is Sarah Leach and Jackie Smith writing for the Holland Sentinel. This is dated March 22nd out of St. Clair County, Michigan, the other side of the state over by uh, Lake Huron. Ottawa County's controversial executive administrative aid is setting his sights higher by filing to run as a state representative in St. Clair County. 23-year-old Jordan Epperson has filed to run as a Republican in the state's 64th district, which includes Worth Township in Sanilac County and the city of Port Huron, plus parts of the city of St. Clair, the townships of Birchville, Clyde, Fort Gratiot, Grant, Kimball, and Marysville, and parts of St. Clair Township. Epperson first made headlines in Ottawa County when he was hired in August to serve as former Ottawa County Administrator John Gibson's executive aide. Epperson did not respond to the Sentinel's request for comment Friday. After hiring Epperson in August, Gibbs was accused of age discrimination after a more qualified finalist for the position went unselected. That finalist, Ryan Kimball, filed the lawsuit against Gibbs and Ottawa County in October. The case remains ongoing. Gibbs, hired after the new Ottawa Impact Majority assumed control of the Ottawa County Board of Commissioners in January 2023, was fired last month after his relationship with OI leaders Joe Moss and Sylvia Rodea soured over months of ongoing controversy, including a year-long lawsuit with the county health officer settled in late February. One week after placing Gibbs on paid administrative leave, commissioners fired him for cause during a special meeting Thursday, February 29th. Days earlier, Moss published to his personal social media accounts that Gibbs faced allegations brought forth by Epperson and new Deputy Administrator Ben Wetmore, also a Gibbs hire. Epperson, a recent graduate of Michigan State University with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice, started with the county August 21st. After the hiring was publicized, Gibbs refused to name whom he hired to avoid a public spectacle. Several residents voiced disdain over Epperson's social media history. Epperson made his Facebook account private and deleted his Twitter account days after his hiring was reported, but not before dozens of screenshots of his previous social media posts had been captured, including several controversial comments about women and immigrants, among other topics. That Epperson was seeking public office was first revealed in an interview with Gibbs on Friday, March 22nd, by independent journalist Scott McMahon in the Bigger Truth podcast. <laughs> when McMahon asked why Epperson was hired, Gibbs said he came, quote, highly recommended, end of quote, by individuals involved in state government. According to his resume, Epperson worked as a part-time aide for Representative Matt Maddock, one of several lawmakers active in Michigan's Grand New Party, a far-right offshoot of the Republican Party. Most recently, Epperson worked as a legislative aide for Northern Michigan State Representative Neil Frisk, also a Grand New Party supporter. Prior to his time with Maddock and Frisk, Epperson worked as a political consultant for Victory Strategies LLC, an organization founded by Wetmore, who most recently worked as a legislative aide to Maddock. He also has ties to several prominent far-right Michigan Republicans, including former Michigan Republican Party co-chair Sean Maddock, one of 16 people charged for allegedly acting as a false elector in the 2020 presidential election. The 64th District is currently represented by Andrew Beeler, who opted not to run for re-election. Beeler said, quote, I don't think the politics is ever meant to be anybody's career. That's certainly what our founders thought, and so I think the same is true for me. I have served two terms, and I'm going to let somebody else have a shot at it, end of quote. Beeler said he's keeping his options open, saying, quote, I don't think it's the end of politics for me altogether. Certainly I'm open to having the opportunity to serve the community again. Dan Lauer's seat will be open in 2026. He'll be term limited, and I'd be able to do two full terms in the Senate. 
That's certainly an interest to me, end of quote. Beeler said he isn't sure what his next step is, but that is likely in the private sector, adding, quote, I would share it if I knew it, but there's not some job lined up. There's no specific plan. I do think that I'll be in the private sector, and so that's an experience that I've not yet had. I went from the Navy to grad school to this, so I do think what's next for me is the private sector, end of quote. So there you go, folks. Another carpetbagger. Oh, I forgot to mention Donald Trump had a press conference after his bail was lowered. This is, I'm going to play the audio of this. This is Garrett Hake, reporter for NBC News, who asked a question about what he's going to do with the money now that he's got it accessible. And Donald Trump basically said, it's none of your business. So we'll, we'll, here's, the, here's the clip right now. You mentioned the cash you had. You said on Friday, it's something like 500 million. You intended yeah. to put some of that into the campaign. Now that the bond's been reduced, are you going to start putting money into your campaign? Yeah. You haven't done that since yeah. 2016. Well, first of all, it's none of your business, I mean, frankly. But uh, I, might, I might do that. I have the option. But if I have to spend $500 million on a bond, I wouldn't have that option. I'd have to start selling things. I don't have to sell anything. If I was Garrett Hake, my response would have been, Mr. Trump, I'm a journalist, and it's my job as a member of the fourth estate to ask you these questions. So it is my business. And I'll say it as a reporter right here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It is everybody's business what Trump plans to do. Like I said, you folks need to look at Project 2025. Put it in your Google machine. If you want something that will keep you from voting for Trump and the Republicans, that'll be it. Project 2025. It's scary as hell, folks. And right now, let's go ahead to our final story of the day. This is Mark Sherman writing for the Associated Press dated March 26 out of Washington. The Supreme Court on Tuesday seemed likely to preserve access to a medication that was used in nearly two-thirds of all abortions in the U.S. last year in the court's first abortion case since conservative justices overturned Roe v. Wade two years ago. In nearly 90 minutes of arguments, a consensus appeared to emerge that the abortion opponents who challenged the FDA's approval of the medication Mifepristone and subsequent actions to ease access to it lack the legal right or standing to sue. Such a decision would leave in place the current rules that allow patients to receive the drug through the mail without any need for an in-person visit with a doctor and to take the medication to induce an abortion through 10 weeks of pregnancy. Should the court take the no-standing route, it would avoid the more politically sensitive aspects of the case. The high court's return to the abortion thicket is taking place in a political and regulatory landscape that was reshaped by its abortion decision in 2022 that led many Republican-led states to ban or severely restrict abortions. Solicitor General Elizabeth Prelegar, the Biden administration's top Supreme Court lawyer, said the court should dismiss the case and make clear that anti-abortion doctors and organizations don't come within 100 miles of having standing. Even three justices who were in the majority to overturn Roe posed skeptical questions about standing to the lawyer for the abortion opponents. Justices Amy Coney Barrett, Neil Gorsuch, and Brett Kavanaugh are Donald Trump appointees. Barrett, for example, seemed to doubt that two doctors identified by lawyer Aaron Hawley could show that they were actually harmed by the FDA's actions, one of the requirements for showing standing. Barrett said, quote, I think the difficulty here is that, at least to me, these affidavits do read more like the conscience objection is strictly to actually participating in the abortion to end the life of the embryo or fetus. And I don't read either to say that they ever participated in that. End of quote. Kavanaugh had only one question during the entire session, and it too seemed to be focused on the technical issue of standing. He asked Prelegar to confirm that under federal law, Quote, no doctors can be forced against their consciences to perform or assist in an abortion, end of quote. Abortion opponents are asking the justices to ratify a ruling from a conservative federal appeals court that would limit access to mifepristone, one of two drugs used in medication abortions. That ruling had immediate political consequences and the outcome in the current case expected by early summer could affect races for Congress and the White House. 
Another abortion case is already on the docket. Next month, the justices will hear arguments over whether a federal law on emergency treatment in hospitals must include abortions, even in states that have otherwise banned them. The scene outside the Supreme Court was lively Tuesday morning, with demonstrators occupying the streets surrounding the court and groups on both sides of the issue marching and chanting. The police blocked traffic surrounding the court as well. The practical consequences of a ruling for abortion opponents would be dramatic, including possibly halting the delivery of mifepristone through the mail and at large pharmacy chains and ending increasingly popular telehealth visits at which the drug can be prescribed. President Joe Biden's administration and drug manufacturers warned that such an outcome also could undermine the FDA's drug approval process more widely by inviting judges to second-guess the agency's scientific judgments. The Democratic administration and New York-based Danco Laboratories, which makes Mifepristone, say that the drug is among the safest the FDA has ever approved. Justice Katani Brown-Jackson, a Biden appointee who joined the court just after the last abortion case, signaled her agreement with some of those arguments when she asked Jessica Ellsworth, Danko's lawyer, whether she has concerns, quote, about judges parsing medical and scientific studies, end of quote. The abortion opponents argue that the FDA's decisions in 2016 and 2021 to relax restrictions on getting the drug were unreasonable and, as Holly wrote in her client's main legal brief, quote, jeopardize women's health across the nation, end of quote. <laughs> No, it doesn't. It helps their health. The Women have the right. I'm sorry. Plain and simple, they have the right to an abortion, period. End of story. She argued Tuesday that she was asking the court to affirm a ruling that, quote, merely restored longstanding and crucial protections under which millions of women used abortion drugs. End of quote. Her husband, Senator Josh Hawley, Republican of Missouri, and one of their children were in the courtroom to watch her first arguments. The Mifepristone case began five months after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Abortion opponents initially won a sweeping ruling nearly a year ago from U.S. District Judge Matthew Kaczmarek, a Trump nominee in Texas, which would have revoked the drug's approval entirely. The Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals left intact the FDA's initial approval of Mifepristone, but it would reverse changes regulators made in 2016 and 2021 that eased some conditions for administering the drug. The Supreme Court put the appeals court's modified ruling on hold, then agreed to hear the case, though Justices Samuel Alito, the author of the decision overturning Roe, and Clarence Thomas would have allowed some restrictions to take effect while the case proceeded. In arguments highly focused on technical legal issues, Alito and Thomas asked some of the few questions Tuesday on the substance of the case, including about sending Mifepristone through the mail. They referred to the Comstock Act, a rarely used 151-year-old criminal law that has been revived by anti-abortion advocates seeking to block the delivery of mifepristone through the U.S. mail. Addressing Ellsworth, Thomas said the law is, quote, fairly broad and it specifically covers drugs such as yours, end of quote. Even if the court doesn't address the Comstock Act in its ruling, some abortion rights advocates fear that a future administration that favors abortion restrictions could invoke the law to roll back access to mifepristone. More than 6 million women have used mifepristone since 2000. It is one of two drugs used in medication abortions. Mifepristone blocks the hormone progesterone and also primes the uterus to respond to the contraction-causing effect of another drug, misoprostol. The two-drug regimen is used to end a pregnancy through 10 weeks of gestation. Healthcare providers have said that if mifepristone is no longer available or is too hard to obtain, they would switch to using only misoprostol, which is somewhat less effective in ending pregnancies. So let's hope that the Supreme Court decides that there's no standing in the case and dismiss it entirely. That would be the best outcome for everybody involved. That's it for this week. We'll be back next week. I'm Darren Gibson. Please support independent media, the First Amendment, and most importantly, a woman's right to choose. The stations that carry Southpaws do not necessarily share the opinions expressed on the show. Southpaws is protected by the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and is copyrighted by Big D Entertainment. All rights reserved.